Hello and welcome everyone to today's program. I am Joan Landis and I'm on the education team here at Weedon Island Preserve. And I am delighted that you could join us for a new episode of the program, Why It Matters. In Why It Matters, we talk about environmental topics and current events with a particular focus on how individuals and um, groups of individuals can make a difference. So uh, today we have a fabulous program just in time for this year's hurricane season, all about hurricanes and climate change. Big topic, lots of fiction surrounding these issues, and also a lot of new and evolving science and facts for us to learn about and apply. So before we get started, um, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And um, I will collect those up and serve them up to our speaker at the end of the program. And also um, stick around after the Q&A because we're gonna have a chance to get to know our speaker a little bit better, Libby Carnahan, our Florida Sea Grant agent. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, here at Weedon Island, we're very fortunate to have a Sea Grant agent resident on the preserve. And not only that, she is a climate change expert and a leader in that science. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you Libby Carnahan. Uh, before we uh, turn the program over to her though, let me tell you a little bit about Libby. Libby Carnahan is the Florida Sea Grant agent for UF IFAS Extension Pinellas County. And like I said, she's here with us at Whedon Island. She holds her climate change professional credential from the Association of Climate Change Officers. She's founder and co-facilitator of the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel, CSAP, that covers the seven county region. She's also an active leader and member of the Gulf of Mexico Climate and Resilience Community of Practice and is serving on the program committee for the 2022 National Adaptation Forum. Carnahan holds a uh, Master's of Science in Marine Science from the University of South Florida and a BS in Biology from Truman State University. And now it is my great pleasure to turn the presentation over to Libby. Thank you. Thank Libby. you very much, Joan, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I was very excited to be invited by Joan to help participate in this uh, online program series that she created uh, both to, as she said, uh, to meet the objective, but also to engage our audiences at Whedon Island uh, during the time of COVID-19 when we weren't able to be here on site in person. Uh, so while we're on different computers, we're actually just down the hall from each other today back at the office at Whedon Island Preserve. And as Joan said, I have a background as a marine scientist. I've been working a lot in climate change and sea level rise with my position as the Sea Grant agent in Pinellas County that I've been in for 10 and a half years now. Uh, so really working on that because that is kind of where the needs are in our county. Uh, we have a lot of other great marine scientists around in St. Petersburg. Uh, so I don't get called away to do some of the things that my other Sea Grant colleagues do. Uh, and I'm able to focus a lot of effort on this effort. Uh, I did see some of you kind of type your name in the chat and, and we do just have, you know, 32 people today. So we do like to hear from you. Um, Joan, you know, can monitor the chat if you guys have questions or wanna just introduce yourselves or say why you're attending the program today. We would love to, to hear that. Um, so let me get my clicker in the right spot. Okay. So uh, for the presentation, I'm gonna give a little overview about kind of what Sea Grant is, who I am. Uh, then I'm going to go into some climate change and sea level rise science, and then transition into some, how that relates to what we know about hurricanes and changes we've seen in recent years. And then I will talk a little bit about what you could do to prepare yourself for this hurricane season and to help combat climate change uh, you know, all in an hour. Um, <laughs> so just a few tips and it'll lead to more discussion as Joan mentioned. Uh, so Sea Grant itself is partnership between 
National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and universities, state, and county governments. Uh, overall, it's a network of over 3,000 scientists, engineers, public outreach experts, educators, and students. We are in every coastal state in Guam, the Great Lakes, uh, Puerto Rico, American Samoa. And the way the program works in each state is a little bit different. Uh, so some states, it is nestled in right with the land grant program, and that is how we operate in Florida. And it works great for me. I have all these resources from my UF IFAS colleagues that work in natural resources, sustainability, water resources that add to my programming. Uh, and then I also have my state Sea Grant Network as well as the National Sea Grant Network. Uh, we do have a uh, National Sea Grant Climate Initiative uh, that we get together and share best practices also. Uh, a little bit just more about what Sea Grant does. Aside from climate change, we work on creating and maintaining healthy coastal environments and economies. So really trying to connect local folks like fishermen, like resource managers, uh, government officials with better information related to our coastal and marine resources so that they can make more informed decisions uh, that are better for the environment, but also hopefully uh, protect their economic bottom line as well. How do we do it? Uh, I am one of the outreach uh, experts, I guess trusted experts. We like to consider ourselves honest brokers. We're not advocates. We come in with the science uh, and we just want the science, you know, we, we suggest that the science can be applied to make more informed decisions. Uh, we do fund a large amount of research uh, that comes down through, through NOAA budget. And then our Florida office has a research coordinator where they review different uh, proposals that are submitted. And those are all uh, from Florida universities. So each state operates kind of state specific. We also fund a variety of scholarships for both undergraduate and graduate students. And so I encourage you, if you know any folks that fit that category, to check out the Sea Grant page uh, under scholarships and check out our Aylesworth scholarships, our Guy Harvey, uh, we've got a lot of great opportunities. And then there is the Knauss Fellow Program as well, which is a prestigious program that places uh, active students in either policy programs or science research programs at the federal level. So uh, Joan did go over my little resume um, from my bio, and this is some of my uh, additional experience in climate change work uh, and the Gulf of Mexico Climate and Resilience Community of Practice is really a key group that I've been operating with uh, since I joined, and that's a network of the five states. Sea Grant programs and NOAA programs, together with local government partners, sharing best practices on communication and uh, adaptation and mitigation responses to climate change. So, this just came out, um, actually the last day I presented uh, a similar talk, I've updated the talk, but you know, May 20th, I'm working on a, on a hurricane talk and then I get a phone alert that says, NOAA predicts six consecutive above average hurricane season. Uh, and I believe they're updating what an average hurricane season is considered as well. Um, so when I talk about climate, you know, we normally look at like, 30 year time cycles and how those change over time, um, kind of before we make changes. You can see the average that they use on the right there is, uh, is from 1991 to 2020. So they averaged over that 30 year time cycle. Uh, we are expecting, as I said, an above average hurricane season. Uh, I, I borrowed some of these slides. The National Hurricane Center has great uh, online education programs, and they share them on YouTube. Uh, there's a very low number of subscribers, as you kind of might imagine, because uh, people aren't necessarily maybe used to going directly to the source for information, but they do do a great job. So if you want more information after this, I encourage you to check out the National Hurricane Center on YouTube. Uh, but here's a slide that they made about a look at all of our storms from 2021. Um, I'm sorry, from 2020. <laughs> it's their webinar this year, but this is the hurricanes from 2020. Um, and here I didn't, yeah, I didn't share the graphic, but um, 
there is a great graphic maybe at the end for playing with websites i'll show you uh, but you can actually see the path of the projections of the storm um, in this graphic that they have available online unfortunately it's just not like a movie it's very embedded on their website um, but it will show that where Hurricane Irma is, so always the X that's over there at 8 a.m. Monday is the real storm and the rest is the projection. And so it shows the changes in the projection over time, which is very kind of impactful to show how in 2017, the entire state of Florida had to brace for the potential of a major hurricane hit. Uh, and we did not know until you know the very last minute when it made that turn up north exactly where it was gonna make landfall. So hurricanes are very serious business. Uh, we all need to prepare for them and plan. And we have time because it happens every year, right? Hurricane season's back, we know it's here. Uh, it gets a little old, but as Floridians, it's our responsibility to uh, prepare responsibly. I wanna thank two major sources for the presentation for the hurricane and climate change portion. Uh, every state does have a climatologist, and our state climatologist is David Zierden, and he's housed up at the FSU Center for Ocean and Atmospheric Prediction Studies. Uh, also, Dr. Allison Wing is at Florida State University in the Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences Department, and she's really been kind of focusing on doing some talks like this uh, out with the kind of general public as well. So she was able to share some of her her talking points based on her primary research. So once again, I'm a uh, science communicator these days. I'm not out there uh, monitoring a tide gauge or an atmospheric station, uh, but I work closely with these scientists who share the data with us. So where do I go for climate change information? My number one go-to source is the National Climate Assessment. This is mandated by the Global Change Research Act of 1990, that every four or five years, a comprehensive report is written for Congress and the President of the United States. Now, this was actually enacted under Republican President George W. Bush, and then was signed into law under Democratic President Bill Clinton. So it did not start out as a political exercise. It was a uh, purely good science and good planning. So what's in the report? 2018, we just got the fourth National Climate Assessment under the Trump presidency, it was published. Uh, there are 10 sector reports uh, for different regions of the United States. So in Florida, we're part of the Southeast US sector report. There's also 16 different uh, sector chapters I think I have 12 of them listed here on um, agriculture, economy, water, indigenous people, infrastructure. And then there are two reports that are written about mitigation and the adaptation options that are suggested for governments. As a reminder, when we talk about uh, emergency management, we usually word the, use the word mitigation to mean how we prepare and prevent for disaster. However, the climate change community borrowed the term and changed it a bit. And so the climate change community uses the word mitigation to talk about decreasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So now I'm gonna get into a little bit of climate science. Um, apologies if this is all very familiar to you, I will try and go through in very plain language and not, uh, not talk down to anyone, but I feel it's always good to refresh. So climate and weather, not the same thing. Weather is basically what's happening outside your window right now. Uh, I'm fortunate it's not that rain uh, that I see, but I see some clouds and a little bit of wind, and it looks like maybe some rain later today. Uh, so that, that's the weather. Climate is long-term. It's taking like 30-year time chunks and averaging them. Uh, so I often say, you know, when when climatologists are looking at the climate, they might, you know, we saw that data set for 1991 to 2020. Well, they would be comparing that probably to 1981 to 2010, and then previously 1971 to 2000. Um, so this is kind of how we look at climate in these big chunks 
of time and over larger regional scales and compare them. And this is just to show you that the climate is affected by many, many things. What does the science say? Okay. So here is a, a nice little carbon cycle graph that I borrowed from another institution, uh, but it gives, it gives a good representation of how, remind, I'm sorry, of reminding us that all living things are made of carbon. So the animals and the trees contain carbon. In this image, your plants would be respiring and breathing in carbon dioxide, breathing out oxygen, and your animals would be breathing in the oxygen and out the carbon dioxide. Uh, but then also you see your little birdie there. Your little birdie happens to die, and then he ends up in the soil after he decomposes, and then say hundreds or thousands of years go by, and then that little birdie could become some peat bog that maybe they would put in that fireplace in that little hut in Ireland, or maybe it would be many, many years later, thousands or tens of thousands of years later, and humans would learn to extract fossil fuels from the earth and turn that into energy and create this amazing industrial revolution, which allowed us all the progress we have today with roads and cars and buildings and all this life. And it's good, but there might be a little too much of a good thing these days. We've been burning a whole lot of fossil fuels and emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we know that the carbon dioxide is necessary as one of the greenhouse gases that helps keep our planet this perfect kind of temperature to sustain human life. However, if we uh, keep getting too much CO2, then we can get more heat trapped from the sun and we get an increased temperature. So hopefully I'll convince you of this with a couple of graphs. <laughs> I say graphs, I should say images. I know we hate to use too many graphs in climate change communication. So here's just an iceberg to remind you of what it could be like if we did not have our greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Uh, the planet could be just zero degrees Fahrenheit. And so I always say livable, but not something us Floridians want to get used to on a daily basis. Uh, so what has the record been showing? Uh, this is a Keeling curve uh, started by a Keeling professor back in 1958. And we've been monitoring the CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii uh, since that time. What you can see here, the wiggle is the intra-annual variation from the growing cycle. We see a steady CO2 rise that is very concerning to us. Uh, we are about at 420 parts per million. Uh, I'm actually gonna be opening a bank account with the exact amount of the parts per million of CO2 that day. And as I keep dragging my feet to get to the bank, the CO2 keeps increasing. Um, it's one way to really just see that it's increasing constantly. Uh, and and hasn't it always been increasing? That's a very common question. Uh, the atmosphere has always been changing over time. We know that our planet has had ice ages and has had tremendous warming periods. So isn't this all just part of something natural, we could ask ourselves. Well, then we look at a recreated uh, image such as this one uh, that looks at the modern measured data on the right end. And then on the left side, that's all uh, recreated proxy data using things like ice cores and sediment cores and analyzing um, carbon isotopes ratios. They can recreate the past environment and, and understand it. And, and what we see is that while CO2 has changed over time, we have not seen this drastic increase in, in what we believe from the proxy record. So what's all this CO2 kind of doing? Where's it coming from? What's it look like? Uh, this is from the EPA, uh, EPA annual report. Shows you carbon dioxide is very dominant in the, uh, in the emissions. So this is all emissions from 2016, just to show you where the sectors come from. So 
energy and transportation are huge and at the top uh, industry and then ag commercial residential uh, hopefully looking at this image you see that we all have a role to play uh, even in everything on the left side of the screen the transportation and the electricity we're all um, we're all taking part in some of that so we don't just get to say we're only the five percent residential because we're really spread across the board as is our responsibility so i showed you the steadily increasing co2 concentrations in the atmosphere here is a graph uh, this is actually from the third national climate assessment but I like this graph because you can really see this, the slopes. What we saw was about a 1.2 to 1.4 degree Fahrenheit increase in the past century. And this next coming century, they're expecting a potential three to seven degree increase uh, in degree, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, looking at this, you can see that the early part of this data set has a flatter slope and then it gets to a steeper slope. So really in recent years, our global temperature is also accelerating. Um, it's increasing at a higher rate than it was at the beginning of the last half of the last century. And here's one graph I just borrowed from NOAA. Um, I will be honest, I don't have a ton to say about it because it's new, but I did wanna, I was trying to find um, the, the nice charts that, that do show the correlation between CO2 and temperature, because we don't often put them together in the same charts, uh, but really they, you can see this is from ICE proxy data, they do follow each other quite uh, quite regularly. So it, it goes, it, it makes good sense as we're seeing it, that as CO2 concentrations increase, so is the temperature, atmospheric temperature. Some other data that we have, uh, and this I kind of, let me, let me add a few sentences for the scientific story to connect it. So CO2 is increasing, temperature is increasing. As atmospheric temperature increases, then at the ocean surface interface, remember the oceans cover 70% of the planet, uh, they start absorbing the heat and they have a very high capacity to absorb heat. So our oceans are also warming and as our oceans warm, they expand. And so thermal expansion is one major cause of sea level rise. The second major cause of sea level rise is the melting of land ice. The melting of land ice seems to be, is contributing more today than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Today, the melting of ice contributes to about 58 or so or 60% of the sea level rise measurement that we're seeing. And the thermal expansion is responsible for about the other 30% or so with some smaller uh, forcings that I'm not going to get into today. Uh, so here we can see the St. Petersburg tide gauge has been measuring since 1946, just using my home tide gauge here. But folks from other areas, you could go to NOAA tides and currents, NOAA tides and currents. Oh, I have an idea. <laughs> I should have my dry erase board here so I could hold up uh, next time. So NOAA Tides and Currents is a great website. You can uh, see sea level rise histories for each of the tide stations and get a graph such as this. You can also check current water levels. So it's the website I like to go to to check during a hurricane, for example. So you could go to St. Petersburg Tide Gauge, but then in Tides and Currents, I click on water levels and then water levels again, and then I'll get a graph uh, that I'll have to show you later that shows the uh, predicted tide, but it has the actual water level on top of that. So if we have an east wind in Tampa Bay, then water is being pushed out of the bay. We can have lower than normal tides. If we have west winds, uh, or southwest winds, then we have water being pushed into the bay and our tide's going to be higher than expected. That happens at a small degree, just with our regular winds and storms, but to a much larger degree with our tropical storms. One of my, I like, I'm proud to call him now a colleague, uh, Dr. Gary Mitchum. He was actually on my master's committee uh, as my statistician. And he is co-author on a paper that has looked at the 25 years of satellite altimetry measurements 
and they show a definitive acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. So now we have you know, over 130 years of tide gauge data, and we have 25 plus years of satellite altimetry data. So two different, very different data sources, not dependent on each other, showing very much the same results. So that's the kind of verification we like to see in science. And this uh, paper pretty much says that the last recommendation by NOAA of the historic linear projection for sea level rise is should not be considered at this point. Um, and so hopefully the next NOAA update, the NOAA multi-agency update for the National Climate Assessment for their sea level rise report um, um, will hopefully be getting rid of that. But they're working on the next report now. I just actually heard from some of the researchers a week or so ago. So they're working hard on the next sea level rise report. Here's um, just our prediction, or not, I'm sorry, not our prediction. Here's our recommendation for the projections to use for planning purposes in the Tampa Bay region. They're based on the NOAA 2017 curves that inform the 2018 climate assessment. What we recommend is using the Army Corps of Engineers online calculator because they have a great calculator that can take the local tide gauge and then use kind of the global predictions for sea level rise and put out a local projection. So that's what we have here. Uh, the NOAA curves do recommend six different curves. Uh, we thought that was very too much for planning purposes. We were able to eliminate the low for the reason that I said. We eliminated the extreme high uh, based on the low probability, but we included a note that for very long-term projects, you still, uh, long-term projects with high risk and high cost, you might wanna consider the extreme. Uh, and then we just kind of chose um, the intermediate over the intermediate, or we chose the high over the intermediate high. And that one was a little, a little more arbitrary, I will say, just to get kind of a spread. Uh, so what does all of this mean for sea level rise and climate change? How is that going to impact our hurricane season? And I appreciate you all sitting through all of that climate change information. I have been told um, that it's helpful. Uh, you can let us know in the chat or later on at the end if you think you know that portion was, was too long. <laughs> but uh, here, you know, we see some of what we saw last year, a very, very active hurricane season. We had 30 named storms. Everyone will not be able to forget that we went into the Greek alphabet and had what alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, and iota. We had nine storms from the Greek alphabet last year. Uh, eta actually hit Pinellas County as a tropical storm, uh, but it was pretty, uh, what did they say, kind of like the perfect storm in terms of the high tide that we had in the direction of the wind. And so unfortunately we had, we had over 80, we had 80 people just on one barrier island, I believe, whose homes were, were destroyed. Uh, and then others in uh, inland, not inland, but um, coastal Tampa Bay neighborhoods uh, experienced extreme flooding as well. There was not a state declaration declared. Uh, I will say I'm a little uncertain on the politics of when a governor decides or does not decide to declare a state declaration. Uh, I believe Sally also caused a lot of trouble in the Panhandle and in localized areas in Escambia maybe and some other counties. And there was also not an emergency declaration for that storm. Uh, we know Laura, as we said, was kind of the worst. Uh, coastal Louisiana, I'm sure, is still in a long process of recovering from 2020 storm. So keep them you know, in your thoughts. Um, but 13 storms, six major hurricanes, um, and 10 that formed in September. So I, I do have a new slide in here of the hurricane season. I'll show you in a second. Uh, so just a little, a little bit to toot the horn of our colleagues at the National Hurricane Center. Um, so they work closely with the National Weather, the NOAA National Weather Center offices. So there is pretty much a National Weather Service office covering everywhere in the United States and also Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa. Um, so I realize our, the footprint of them is very similar to that of Sea Grant. Uh, and they're out there giving forecasts, 
uh, and working closely with the hurricane centers to get the messages out that they're providing during hurricane season. So uh, here's a screenshot I took of Robbie Berg. Uh, he would probably <laughs> kill me if he saw that picture. I'll work on a better screenshot when he's talking. Uh, but I did like this slide that he has that shows uh, our the peak of when we do experience our storms. And September 10th can really be singled out there as, as peak hurricane season. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should uh, you know, not pay attention now. We need. We still need to pay attention, uh, but you know, ramp up your preparation and be aware that you know it should it should well be over by. You're, you should be prepared by August, certainly, um, really now. But but you could see the chunk of this hurricane season and where it lies. Uh, as a reminder, when we're talking about hurricanes, our primary hazards include all of the below. High winds, storm surge, heavy rainfall, and dangerous surf. This is a picture of Hurricane Michael uh, from up in Panama City. So this would have been a lot of wind damage and I'm not sure if at this site if the water had reached it. So what do we know? I hope that through my intro, you believe that seas are rising. We have measured data to show sea level rise at tide gauges around the world. This is an example here of the uh, what the predicted tide is on the bottom and then the real water level is on the top. So that's what you could get if you look during storm season. I think I went back and took this from, uh, from Ada to show the surge we had during Ada. So we do know that the storm surges are going to be higher because we have sea level rise. We have more water than we did before. Our high tides are higher. Uh, so it's not necessarily like just an additive value that you could say it's gonna be a foot higher because there was a foot of sea level rise. But our folks at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council have done some great modeling exercises. Uh, so so we can see more specifically what the sea level rise might look like on top of current storm surge. They also have a great uh, Hurricane Phoenix video and they've recreated it that is a very impactful video but shows what it will look like if uh, this area experienced a category five hurricane direct hit. Uh, that's something um, I can kind of share the link for that after I'm done talking. Um, but I encourage people to go out if you're interested to watch that. Just make sure that if you ever share it, make sure everybody knows that you're just sharing it um, as for educational purposes and we're not actually experiencing that storm. So the National Hurricane Center has also been um, employed social scientists uh, and they're paying more attention to how the messaging uh, gets put out and how people respond to the messaging that's put out. So I am now, you know, I am a former scientist and current science communicator and just words matter, words matter so much. Um, half of the deaths associated with tropical cyclones have been through storm surge, uh, but there wasn't really kind of a storm surge warning in the past. It used to really focus on the winds, right? That's how we court categorize the hurricanes. We categorize them by wind speed. So that seems to be what people kind of focus on. Um, however, storm surge can be deadly. And so they've adjusted those messages. As you see on the right, this was a prototype of the storm surge watch warning graphic um, from 2014. And so they've really kind of ramped that up. And that's something that's included in each storm forecast. So we want to run from surge. So if you are in an evacuation zone, I really encourage you to heed evacuation warnings. If you're on a barrier island, leave that barrier island. Go to the mainland and find someone on the, somewhere on the mainland where you can hide from the wind. So it doesn't mean that you have to evacuate, you know, um, 
10 counties away or out of state or halfway across the country. So figure out what's right for you, plan ahead so that you can plan wisely. I know a lot of us are gun shy, like going over to Orlando because of you know Hurricanes Charlie's in, in the past, Polk County and Orlando has ended up getting hit as bad as the coastal areas. Um, so just really consider your evacuation plan thoughtfully. Another thing that we know for sure is we are seeing more rain and inland flooding. So climate change is making the atmosphere warmer and the water warmer. And as when that is the case, then more the hurricane develops more energy from the warm water uh, and they get bigger. Well, hang on, I'll say that in a second. I'm not, <laughs> but they, uh, but they are, you know, this is an example of Hurricane Harvey. And Harvey, I remember watching him headed towards Texas and I believe the forecast was almost the perfect circle. Uh, I saw that with Debbie before um, when she just hovered over kind of the Big Bend area of Florida. And that's really what, what happened with Harvey. He hovered and he sat like Florence on North Carolina um, and dropped so much water. And we're saying we are gonna see more of that and so inland areas that aren't necessarily in the National Flood Insurance Program required to have flood insurance, we are seeing that they're flooding. Um, so there's clearly a lot of work to do with the National Flood Insurance Program to work on how they map and um, kind of forecast what houses might get flooded. Uh, and, and obviously we might need to work more, uh, more rain into some of those models, uh, as I'm not sure that it's, in the models now. Um, this shows a little bit of historic changes in heavy precipitation. This is from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, so what you see here is days with precipitation above three inches. And if it's red, it means we're getting more of them. And if it's blue, it means we're getting less of them. Um, but you can see a lot, of, a lot of red on the map. So a lot of these areas, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean changes in the total amount of rainfall over a given time, but that that rain is coming in more heavy episodic events. If those events happen to be coupled with a higher tide, then you're going to more likely have street flooding and backed up stormwater canals, especially on barrier islands and other places. So we are seeing increased storm intensity more major storms. So more category three, four, and five. And they are attributing this to the climate change signal. More major storms. Now I'm gonna get into what we don't know as much about. Okay, here's a reminder. I liked this graphic. I think I got it from the Hurricane Center. So this is only focused on wind. So the blue is actually land. Um, so I'm gonna have to look back where I got this and kind of <laughs> let them know messaging wise, you know, having land be blue, not necessarily the easiest. <laughs> Everyone's like, is that the water? No, I think it's land. Uh, anyway, so you could see that with category one, uh, not really much happened to the house, but the two, you start to get the landscape uh, tearing apart. And then, you know, three, four, and five, it starts to impact the home. Uh, we, we have seen rapid intensification of storms in recent years, but the climate change signal is uncertain. Uh, so we're kind of on hold. We're not saying that climate change is not causing the rapid intensification, but my climatologist colleagues uh, haven't determined this yet. And you know, there's a lot that they're looking at. They are looking at these longer climate changes that I talked about. So yeah, so we've got um, Michael here. I mean, just just look at uh, at the bottom. So we're you know on the sixth, it's at 35 miles per hour. By the eighth, it's 75, and then when it hits landfall, it gets up to 160 miles per hour. Uh, you know, people were not, I, I'd have to go back to look at the forecast and when and when the National Hurricane Center started to uh, forecast it as, an, as expecting it to be a major hurricane. But 
you know, those messages are hard to get out, like on the 6th, if you've got a storm that's only 35 miles per hour and you're trying to tell people that they need to pack up and evacuate their homes. Um, so getting this understanding of the rapid intensification out is important. Um, you know, we're not certain if we see it as a climate change signal, but I feel like it's something we're seeing more frequently. Um, here we go. Um, so in terms of the number of hurricanes also, uh, it's uncertain as to whether that is climate change that is impacting that or other variables. Uh, I'm going to share, well, this one's on, on kind of the next, the next tab. But, okay, yeah. Um, in terms of whether there are more or less hurricanes, uh, folks are working on this. Michael Mann is part of a team that just came out with this report, multi-decadal climate oscillations during the past millennium dri driven by volcanic forcing. Um, so he looks at the volcanic forcings and the other forcings to really try and determine uh, if these are anthropogenic causes or as, as could be in some cases, there could be some, some volcanic or other forcings contributing. Um, so that's kind of, as Joan said, you know, the research is always ongoing. I will say I haven't dove in and got my teeth into this uh, report yet, but I do look forward to reading it and trying to, you know, get a deeper understanding myself of, of the science. And there you can see uh, at the start of his, uh, or the abstract, it says the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is a 50 to 70 year quasi periodic variation of climate centered in the North Atlantic region. It was long thought to be an internal oscillation of the climate system. And man at all is now showing this variation is to be forced externally by high amplitude explosive volcanism. Um, so that's a different signal that that's being looked at. So is the hurricane season longer than before? Well, for the past six years, we have had a storm that start that formed before June 1st. So that kind of makes it seem like it's getting longer. Uh, this year, the National Hurricane Center started giving out their forecasts on May 15th. Uh, and so they did not officially change the date of the start of hurricane season but they did, uh, they did start giving their warnings earlier. And we've seen storms already this year. Now I'm gonna read something from climatologist David Zierden, just so I can credit it to him and, uh, and not mess it up at all. Uh, and so he's saying changes in what's considered an average Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, NOAA's following the standards procedures and using the 30 year average that we've talked about, updated every 10 years as prescribed by the World Meteorological Organization. The numbers are high now because we abruptly entered the active phase of the 40 year cycle related to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation in 1995. So we're not sure if there is a climate change connection there. So we're stay tuned, we're monitoring all the storms. We definitely want to uh, make sure that the National Hurricane Center is monitoring as long as they need uh, before and after the quote, traditional hurricane season from June 1st to December 1st, uh, as we have seen storms outside that period, but climatologists aren't, just aren't ready to assign that to a climate change signal yet. Uh, I really appreciate their, uh, I would say they're being very conservative kind of with these last three points that I made that we may find out later that climate change is a driver um, and human caused climate change is a driver, but we don't wanna overstate what we're not certain of. Um, so, so I will summarize that here, that climate change um, is causing Hi, and, and I do see there's lots of comments in the chat and I haven't looked, so I'm waiting till the end. I'm um, hoping there's some good comments and questions that we'll address. Uh, so climate change is causing higher storm surge. We know this. More inland flooding. We know this, more rain, more major storms. 
We're a little more uncertain about the rapid intensification of the storms, the number of storms per season, and the length of season. Uh, we do, I mean, we have seen more storms per season, and it seems like we're seeing a lengthier season in recent years, but we're just not ascribing that to climate change yet. Doesn't mean we do anything different for monitoring. Monitoring stays the same. So for you all, I want you to be prepared. Uh, I don't want there to be anyone in this group that is not prepared for hurricane season, all 37 of us. <laughs> so keep your kit, kit fresh. Uh, check for that you have plenty of canned foods in your house that you like. I mean, it's not really a reason to go out and buy. Oh, I bought some kind of chili a few years ago for Irma and then ate it after. <laughs> it, was, it was not good. Um, so, you know, buy food that you like that stores well. Uh, keep your batteries on hand. Uh, I'm going to share in the next slide some paperwork that's good to keep in mind. I'm also going to share with you the Pinellas County website that has all this information and much more on it. Uh, and if you're from another county, I would refer you to your county's emergency management website because you'll get very location specific information that you need. Some tools to have on hand, of course, the manual can opener. Uh, feel free to Google YouTube uh, millennials trying to use manual can opener, some good stuff. Um, I love millennials. Sorry if I made a light joke there. Uh, fire extinguishers, your battery powered NOAA radio. These are good to have. Uh, and I said batteries again, because you can't say batteries enough. Uh, for your evacuation plan, know your zone. Zones can change year to year. Check your county website, know your zone. Have an evacuation plan. Will you go to a local shelter? Or will you board up your house and stay put? That's not really a good evacuation plan. Don't do that if you're on the beach. Um, you know, check with your elderly neighbors and I'll share some information about special need folks and how we can make sure to take care of them. Uh, if you're gonna evacuate, make sure your yard and your home is secure on the outside that you're not gonna have projectiles that could hurt other people's homes. Uh, we also have information on the Pinellas website about securing your boat. Progressive Insurance made a wonderful uh, video series together with Sea Grant a few years ago. Of course, never forget your medications and your pet medications. It's just a list of some important paperwork to remember. Uh, having things backed up digitally these days in a cloud is a good potential uh, option, although you know clouds can have their own issues as well. So duplicate copies, duplicate places, uh, not a bad idea, but otherwise just have your stuff, you know, ready. So it's just a bin that you grab, grab and go. This is our Pinellas County Emergency Management website. Shows you how to know your zone, how to get prepared, prepare your pets. Um, information for after the storm. Uh, if we do have a storm, be careful of uh, what do we call those folks, the word con artist is coming to mind. But uh, yeah, hackers, people, People will call and lie um, and ask for your information and, um, and to be very, be very careful and cautious after a storm. To get information on your phone up to date, uh, I encourage everyone um, in Pinellas County to sign up on Alert Pinellas. Uh, you can do so online there at that website. If you're in another county, check to see if you guys have emergency alert uh, network that you can sign up for. On social media, the hashtag Hurricane Strong was used some to advertise, or not advertise, but to you know market and share best information about preparing for hurricanes. And there is a phone number for Pinellas County, and that is for during storms, if you need to contact emergency management and have questions. I'll just read that, 727-464-4333. Um, for during storms. For our special needs, friends and family and neighbors, there is a special website uh, on Pinellas County, that's pinellascounty.org slash emergency management. I'm sorry, slash emergency, not emergency, and slash special needs .htm. Uh, If you go there, you can learn all sorts of information about public shelter lists. But there is a registration uh, process for all special needs folks that they could get signed up. They can 
care whether they're uh, dependent upon oxygen or what other needs they have so that the shelters can, can best accommodate them. I heard a talk just probably about six years ago, maybe five. Um, but at the time they said only 10% of the special need folks in our county had been registered. Now I will check with them and I'm sure that that number has been updated, but even if it's 50%, that means there's still 50% that need to be registered. So let's work really hard on, on getting our friends and neighbors familiar with this. Uh, it is a paper sheet that you print out, currently fill out and paper mail in uh, because they do find that that, that is what has worked best. Um, we're gonna, they're, they're working on revamping their system and are always uh, working on feedback. So if you have feedback on this, please, um, please share it with me and I can share with, with Pinellas County. Um, yeah, okay. So now I'm just gonna do a few slides just about kind of the climate change part and how we can help a little with that. And then we'll go into questions. These are the summaries from the National Climate Assessment. We know that climate's changing. It's not something for the future. It's been happening now already for decades. We've been measuring it and we now can see it with our eyes in the changes in the water and the plants and the animals and the flowering times and the decreasing and freezing nights. And it's all, it's all there for us to see if we kind of just take a step back and, and assess it. Um, we're already feeling the threats, but, but Americans, you know, we're being threatened physically, socially, economic well-being, but we're resilient. Um, so we are responding. People are reducing risks by adapting uh, and building living shorelines in their communities to decrease hurricane risk by planting trees to increase the amount of uh, oxygen in the air, decrease um, kind of have more things that are sequestering the carbon versus uh, outputting carbon while working to build resilience and improve their lives. So this slide is from the National Climate Assessment. It's, it's a little overwhelming. It does say that even if we plan now that we are still going to have climate change and sea level rise. Um, we're, a little, we're a little late to the game, but any effort that we make now is, is going to help. And I think it's time for bold, time for some bold action. And uh, I'm glad that, that our county has hired a sustainability and resilience director, uh, Hank Hadi, who's all for bold action. And uh, the federal government and the state government are starting to put funding towards climate change, risk planning and resiliency. And uh, we did see some money from the governor allocated to multiple projects in our area. And uh, that was announced, I believe this winter or late, late spring. Uh, and then we know that more funding is gonna be coming out and we're keeping an eye on those funding cycles. Uh, of course, you can climate prep your home by changing all your light bulbs. Uh, we used to say CFLs, now it's LED, even more efficient. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to be able to afford solar and got that up and took advantage of the 30% federal rebate. Uh, I believe that rebate's still in place. I'm not sure if it's still 30%. Uh, you can always have Duke Energy or your energy provider come out to your house and give you an energy audit or upon then you'll also get some nice little freebies. Uh, so I encourage you if you have an older home, you could look into different techniques for retrofitting an older home. And we actually have some, I'm making a note because we do have some folks that work on things like that, like some C grant funded projects working at different uh, ways to prepare your attic of an older home so that it's less likely uh, to suffer wind damage. So those thing, information is out there and uh, something I could do a future talk on. Uh, so retrofitting old homes for hurricanes, I'm, I'm making it because I have an old home. So I also have a personal interest in that, I would say. Um, getting, when you update your windows, getting impact resistant windows, uh, which in some places is required by, uh, by law anyhow. Definitely go out and be stewards of this information. Uh, share the information with your friends and neighbors. If you think you're talking to someone who does not think that climate change is caused by human action, uh, take a deep breath. Um, try not to just talk about that part of it. 
You know, you don't have to start with where you have differences. Start the conversation with where you have similarities. You know, start talking about your kids or your grandkids or the hurricane season or the webinar that you heard about. Um, and, you know, you can ask people what their concerns are. Are they prepared for hurricane season? What, what did they feel about from Irma? Um, are they ready for hurricane season again? You know, there's a lot of ways to just talk to people and, um, and not create division. And there's a lot more information that you can find. NOAA and NASA both have great climate newsletters that come out. Uh, I'd be a little bit leery of blogs where you uh, cannot see who the authors are. I recommend sticking with universities, with federal agencies, uh, you know, nonprofits who you can see the list of who's on the board and you can know what their intentions are. Get involved. Um, why not run for elected office? <laughs> uh, I've had, you know, seen people that um, I know. I know, kind of across the Tampa Bay area, we've had uh, women and men alike step up from professional jobs and careers to run for elected office. Because if not them, if not them, then who? So it's an option. Uh, there's also a lot of boards at city and county level looking for citizen engagement. Uh, you know, urban forestry boards or sustainability boards, city beautification boards. You know, you can infuse this climate change and sea level rise planning into any of those things. You could say, if we're going to beautify the city, shouldn't we be planning for for trees that will do better in 30 years uh, versus ones that, that did better 30 years ago. Um, so lots of lots of things to think about in terms of climate change and, um, and just how you can get involved. This is where you can find me uh, online, although I'm trying to be a little more in-person these days and a little less online. Uh, I've got a brand new TikTok account if you're on TikTok. Find me and follow me, and I will provide uh, some educational information there soon, uh, or maybe just some fun engagement. And uh, other than that, I think we're kind of ready uh, for the Q&A part. And um, Joan, I guess, do you want to facilitate the questions or the comments in the chat if there was any? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just let, leave that out to you. Thank you so much, Libby. That is some great information that you shared with us today and um, especially important for us Floridians and also obviously uh, coastal Pinellas County folks. Um, we have had uh, some of the attendees let us know where they are. So we've got um, we've got a group of folks from from all over from Manatee County from the from Everglades University and um, and uh, so on and so forth. So quite exciting. Um, we don't have questions per se, but I wanted to share with you um, a couple of the um, comments that we had. I know um, hopefully Kathleen has, has learned some things. I love that you um, really put an emphasis on what we can do and how we can get involved. Um, but uh, she was concerned with hurricanes. We all have a concern. Um, she lived through Irma. And um, this information was, was, was very, very helpful. Um, this, uh, let's see, Ken shared that uh, there is a Florida Maritime Museum, um, Cortez, Manatee County. And uh, he says there's, an, it's, there's a great outdoor exhibit on storm surge there. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Libby. I'm not. And actually, our friend Jeff Motes oh. <laughs> was here with us today, was instrumental in setting up that museum. Oh, uh, and so I visited it during the Cortez Seafood Festival, but I didn't go inside and I did not know about the storm surge exhibit. So thank you for sharing that. I'm uh, very interested in making some um, kind of tide gauges, uh, you know, either painted or decorated, you know, but getting them around around Whedon and other places to kind of show where where water levels, you know, could come up to with sea level rise. Uh, so I'd love to see how they they've done their exhibit. Um, and it's a good excuse to go down to, to Sarasota County and see my colleagues. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, you had some great ideas 
for people about how you can get involved, running for office, get, uh, becoming um, active on boards and so forth. Uh, you also talked about living shorelines and I'm wondering if that might be a volunteer opportunity if you could explain in a little bit more detail about what a living shoreline is, what its purpose is, and how uh, we might be able to get involved in that project, that type of a project. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so living shorelines, basically the idea is that, you know, um, well, look behind Joan's picture. She has, uh, that's a whole lovely living shoreline there of our mangrove forest that we have here at Weedon Island. Uh, those are a little bit more uh, islands probably in that particular picture, but, but our whole coastline does look like that. And, you know, we don't have seawalls here at Wheaton Island, but if you look across the bay, um, you can see that most of the houses are, are um, fortified with seawalls. So there's a lot of discussion uh, on using plants uh, to stabilize sediments and, you know, your property versus the seawalls. And, it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. Engineers are looking kind of at, at a lot of options right now. Uh, you know, there's the idea if, if everyone else on your seawall has a seawall and you take yours out, then, then you're probably gonna risk scouring, um, you know, from, from being the only one not there. But if we look at these at larger scales, maybe small, small um, rows of houses together, uh, you know, scientists might be able to look at where a living shoreline might be applicable uh, to replace a seawall or even maybe put some plants in front of the seawall and, and possibly uh, have kind of a staged retreat. So I do know um, some colleagues of mine have done a workshop for uh, basically developers and contractors on living shorelines and um, I, I really want to review that information and I know we did have several uh, we did have quite a bit of participation from Tampa Bay, they told me. So they did it as a statewide program. Um, and so I'm excited about that. And I've also had a few more inquiries about living shorelines. Uh, okay, really quick, in Felipe Park, uh, Pinellas County is going to be putting up the sh living shoreline, but they're also going to be monitoring it uh, very closely, I think. So what we've done in the past is one of our uh, nonprofits, Tampa Bay Watch, They've been very active in doing, uh, like, they're not sea oat planting, but secret, it's a type of grass, uh, marsh grass, Spartina alterniflora. So generally, if we have a barren shoreline uh, in Tampa Bay, but one uh, where we know things could grow, you know, like, not like a beach where there's heavy waves and we know we're not going to succeed. But if you're on a back bay and you have a nice, calm, uh, empty shoreline, you know, we could plant the Spartina. And then what happens over time is that the seedlings from the mangroves that are, you know, the big ones are about the size of a pen. So they float around and they get caught in those grasses. And then in about 10 years time, you actually have a whole mangrove community that looks almost like what behind Joan looks like. So that's kind of the method that we've used. Um, you can see a lot of this down in the south part of Tampa Bay, Terracea Aquatic Preserve, the Rock Ponds, Cockroach Bay Aquatic Preserve. Um, so those were input with hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours. So to direct you to um, the possibility to help out, I would say Tampa Bay Watch, get on their newsletter and keep up with their volunteer opportunities. Uh, you could also help make oyster domes with them with concrete. Um, if you want to, you know, just get some heavy labor in to, <laughs> to remember that you're alive and thriving. Uh, they also uh, handle the the salt marsh plantings and they, they scallop searches. So they're a good list. Uh, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program is a very good newsletter to get on. Uh, Joe Whalen, their new, um, their new communications coordinator, and they will do uh, Give a Day for a Bay. And so they do those about quarterly and those often involve some living shoreline plantings. And then Tampa Bay Aquatic Preserves uh, is where I had my home for five years at that office. And uh, the director, Randy Reynolds, I believe, I know that he's actively working with universities again to get college students out. Um, I'm not sure how much capacity he has for taking volunteers out, but I would say more so if you were part of a small group and maybe you could go to the Aquatic Preserve and say we have a small group already and we'd like to do a day with you, that would probably be something that that he would be interested in. So uh, 
and keep pinellas beautiful just another one that comes to mind a lot of that is cleanups but uh but that's so so important and they uh they actually have new programs like they're doing an adopt a water goat program for all of our water goats that are collecting marine debris um, around the county so that that doesn't get into the waterways um, so lots of lots of volunteer opportunities if you sign on to those newsletters Debbie, I wanted to ask you um, a question kind of directed more about you as a Sea Grant agent and your career. Um, I think it's fascinating that you founded the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about that panel and some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, so the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel was out of the need for more coordination in terms of the sea level rise work that we, is being done in the region by different agencies and universities. So we formed to kind of bring everyone together to share what they were doing, to share best practices, um, and to also kind of minimize duplication in the region and maximize output and impact. Uh, so we first wrote our, uh, to the members of the CSAP. Uh, it's about 15 members deep with then uh, alternates consists of scientists from our counties in the regional planning, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council footprint. Also scientists from agencies like US Geological Survey, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, NOAA, um, University Academia, uh, College of Marine Science, Gary Mitchum is really our, our, really our lead Sea level rise scientist on the team uh, in terms of people who've spent their whole career doing this work, uh, and so we came together to make our first rec uh, our first kind of objective was to publish a recommendation for the sea level rise projections for our region. And so we first published that in 2015 and updated it in 2019. Uh, and so that has been taken up, and it's basically the starting point of planning. If you're going to do any kind of climate change or adaptation planning, you need to know what you're planning for. What's the future maybe going to look like? Uh, so that's what those sea level projections um, can be utilized for. And uh, the next step is generally conducting vulnerability assessments, um, kind of putting those sea level rise projections on top of maps or, uh, you know, overlays and seeing what capital improvement um, or what you know, assets you have that might be impacted, how your water treatment plants are looking, your hospitals and all. Um, so Pinellas County has just conducted a very large scale vulnerability assessment with money that they got from BP oil spill. Uh, and I think they matched the money themselves. So it's a big assessment, it's coming out now. Uh, they did things like create a layer of all the stormwater drainage uh, in all 24 municipalities plus the county together in one GIS layer. Uh, and so lots of times when we're planning for sea level rise and climate change and we make the maps, it does not take any uh, infrastructure into account. It's just the bathtub map that shows up and down. Uh, and so now with the stormwater infrastructure, we'll be able to do some real, they'll be able to do some real more gritty uh, planning um, and see, you know, what some more reality in terms of you know the future modeling and so on um and then just using pinellas county as an example i'll continue on because we've got some awesome things um so kelly levy who is a member of the climate science advisory panel and now is the director of public works uh she took it upon herself uh and well she was kind of tasked by the county commission to take the sea level rise projections and then figure out how to use them because you know there's not just one line and and so she made a an, a tool that's now becoming an online tool for capital improvement projects um, she made it as a spreadsheet tool where you could put in the project put in the elevation the costs uh, and then it would tell you you know whether you should be planning for sea level rise and um, and and it allows you to um, kind of do a project level assessment in that way and then the next step after these folks get these big vulnerability assessments, um, then they have to look at what they actually want to plan for and, and make an adaptation action plan. Uh, now currently our region under the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council 
is writing a resiliency action plan. Uh, and so you can find that online at their website. They were accepting comments through June 4th, but I'm sure they will take your comments whenever you have them. Um, it's a rolling, you know, it's a rolling document. Uh, trying and what they're doing, I will say, is they're doing the app, the action plan before vulnerability assessment in the region. So it's a little more, um, it's a little more based on what we know uh, other other people are planning for in terms of their adaptation action plans. Um, but it's not like nitty gritty in terms of saying we need to save this building over that building or anything like that. Um, so yeah, that explains it a little. Um, we formed the CSAP because we needed scientific consensus in the region so that we could give that information to planners, floodplain managers, um, so that they could start to incorporate that and then, uh, and then assess vulnerability and move towards planning for adaptation and mitigation actions in the future. Great work. Great work. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for heading that up and, and making that come together, Libby. And, Welcome back. Oh my gosh, a breath yeah. of fresh air. Thanks for being <laughs> back at the preserve. It's so nice to have you. I can't thank you enough for doing this program and uh, helping us understand the most current science and um, and also the uh, you know how we what we can do and how we can get involved in it. Um, we just had a question. Let me that popped up. Let me uh, serve that up to you if that's okay. Uh, Janet is wondering what is Pinellas County doing to prevent slash limit toxic algae bloom that kills our fish and affects our airways. Um, I guess there's two questions. Why was it determined that people's homes who chose to live next to holding areas deemed more important than everyone in the county and our sea life being affected? Tough question. Yeah, I'm not sure that I fully understand the part about the people in the holding areas. Um, that, prob that probably comes from something that unfortunately happened to maybe one of our participants personally. And so I, I guess I I can't really apologize on behalf of the county. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, um, but I will address, um, I will say our county is very concerned about, about toxic algae blooms and, um, and, and is actually making an impact to make a difference. So, you know, the fertilizer ordinance that was passed uh, just about right before I came on, so maybe circa 2009, uh, that was set to limit the nitrogen input into the bay during the rainy season. Uh, because we know that when nitrogen goes into the water, uh, that there's different uh, phytoplankton, so floating plant, microscopic plant plankton algae, that then can start to feed on the nutrients and then can start to bloom. Um, and so there are various types of harmful algal blooms. Um, some aren't that big of a concern and can start near shore. Um, others are more of a concern. Um, we do get like say trichodesmium blooms in upper Tampa Bay that I know are very concerning and I'm not exactly sure of you know the cause for that versus others. Um, just to remind us, uh, red tide starts offshore and then it does uh, move inshore. And if there are nutrients available, then it can feed the bloom to grow it even more. Um, so us decreasing our direct nitrogen input into the bay is very important. Uh, you know, we, we um, the, the county would say that really, um, you know, they're not, they're not limiting folks from having turf lawns, but, but really the Florida friendly landscaping way that UFIFIS teaches uh, does require less fertilizer and less water on your lawn and therefore would be better for the environment but we drive around and we still see a whole lot of turf out there, you know, um, not to point the blame and with golf courses, other places just to maintain their businesses. Um, there's a certain amount, you know, that they need to do. Uh, let me just toot Kelly Levy's horn again for one second. Um, she's a rock star. Uh, during red tide, I believe then it would have been 2018 this was two, or maybe 19. Uh, maybe 2019. It's a really bad red tide down in Sarasota, um, and they were responding Sarasota manatee, and it was looking like it could come our way. And um, and there was bad fish kills. And Kelly Levy, uh, she really mobilized and did 
did a, a multi-prong effort so that our impact in Pinellas County was so much less than it could have been. Uh, fishermen shrimp boats from Louisiana came over and were employed to collect the dead fish kills offshore. She employed, or you know, I should say the county, the county employed local uh, charter fishermen, um, fishing guides that generally ran small boats to help with inshore efforts of, of collecting fish, um, doing other monitoring. Uh, there was an online website that showed where all the different dumpsters were, where things could be deposited, coordinated very quickly to get a memorandum of understanding between every beach, all nine beach communities and the county um, in terms of their response to the red tide. And yeah, just citing those few things was, I mean, that was huge in terms of, of decreasing the impact. That said, they were going out on the boats. There was a lot of, you know, large fish and sea turtle and, and dolphin impacts that year. And um, I know it was, I know it was really hard for them um, just, to, just to even see that stuff. And so really this is something that, that everyone that I know who's a scientist or, you know, works for the county, everybody wants, wants healthy waters in Pinellas County. Um, they are being monitored constantly uh, and you know, um, like I said, the county has done quite a bit, but but we do know that there's that there's more to do, um, and there's also a lot more to understand. I'll say that Florida Sea Grant, um, one of my colleagues, Betty Stogler, um, S T A U G L E R, she wrote a position for herself into a grant, and so she now has a new position, and I believe it's a national position as a harmful algal bloom communications coordinator. So hopefully we're gonna see more uh, kind of more messaging coming out of Sea Grant for harmful algal blooms, better ways to understand them and better talking points for how we could all um, change behavior to, to decrease tabs, um, you know, minus the part of nature where they're just going to happen. We do know that humans are also contributing to them and we wanna decrease that impact. You know, and that's so important. And your role and Sea Grant's role as a communicator um, is so very important because this, the science, you can get bogged down in the puts and the takes with the science. And there's an awful lot of it and it's evolving. Um, and so, you know, critical uh, roles that you, that you, that you folks fill. Um, okay, we have one more question um, from June. Do you think the work you are doing will change if there is federal political change? That's, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think um, I've been doing all this work with very little, um, you know, there, there's been very little going on at the, at the national level. Uh, even I would say, you know, under President Barack Obama, there was, um, you know, there was entry to the to the Paris Treaty Accord, but we didn't see like a whole program set up for, you know, funding failing infrastructure from climate change, um, you know, and so really we haven't seen that much momentum until now. Um, we're hearing a lot of good things out of this administration. I know it's all still kind of in the works in terms of how the money is going to come down, um, but we've, you know, we've heard from the the DEP, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, I believe is gonna have um, 100 million. It sounds like a lot, that might be wrong, but a lot of money, you know, big money, uh, pointed at these at these projects um, where the states, cannot, the, you know, different entities in the state will be able to apply for those. We know that that's getting announced really soon. So we're all kind of waiting to hear that. Um, yeah, it's kind of like we've been working towards this. Um, so I'll say we've been doing a lot of good work locally and regionally around the country. Um, I could just say Southeast Florida was a great uh, a great model for us to look at when we started. We haven't done everything the same as them, but we are definitely inspired by them and the compact they created. Uh, you know, over almost 15 years now or more, and places like San Francisco, San Diego, Austin, Annapolis, and Norfolk. Uh, New York City, you know, Manhattan, um, Chicago. I mean, these 
big things have been happening at cities and and regionally and i think it's exciting that now we might see some some federal funds and some federal planning come at it um and yeah that's i guess that's my response to that and um yeah, and if the politics change again, you know, it can change the other way. Our local politics can change. I won't say, but, you know, some of our counties recently have had some changes in their boards and therefore has seen some changes in the direction um, that that they want to go with planning for climate change and sea level rise. So it, uh, it's best to, you know, it's best to be prepared. prepared. Um, but politics is always going to change. So it's important that, you know, the on the ground folks just kind of that we keep doing our work and um, you know, respond as necessary to the changes in political climate. Very good, very good. All right, well, um, thanks again, Libby. Um, appreciate all that you've shared with us today and your ongoing work to our audience. Thank you for, for coming, for staying, and um, wanted to remind you that we have a lot of really cool programs coming up. Take, check them out on the front page of our website, weedandislandpreserve.org. Just uh, scroll down the front page and you'll see a list of everything from programs on um, understanding sharks to coexisting with coyotes and um, even how to um, uh, start a career in herpetology. So um, really interesting and uh, diverse lineup. And we uh, love your participation. Thank you so much. You're a great audience. And uh, once again, Libby, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>